The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, hello and welcome to the third and final day of the Compose course. Thank you for uh, sticking through it and um, let's dig right in where we left off yesterday. So hopefully everything made sense uh, as far as those last chapters we went through, including plotting and handle management. I would say handle management is probably, uh, the, it's not all too bad, but it is probably one of the more tricky parts of the uh, overall training class. So what we're going to do today in day three is uh, go through um, about uh, three more chapters or so and introduce you to some final aspects of the uh, code. And then I will demo some things towards the end so that we can get uh, make you aware of what is there, even if there uh, isn't quite enough time to do hands on for that. So looks like you can see my screen. So I will go on to chapter six here. Now this one is a little bit of a catch-all for um, an entire set of groups really, a group of groups for what are binned into something called higher level functions. And so we can go through and see what those are. Uh, in Compose, there are uh, libraries automatically built in of many, many different types of commands. We've already touched on certain portions, but when it gets down into like pure math processing, uh, there are commands that are reserved for or derived from performing uh, signal processing. There are commands for basically using the numerical methods built in to do uh, solving of differential equations, and then some optimization uh, block capability. So let me go ahead and start up the code here, give that a minute, and then we'll get right into the details of what these are. Okay, so I'm going to start with signal processing, and for that one, well, I'll give a little bit of background as to what this is and where it applies. Um, first of all, signals is just a fancy name for um, you know a stream of numbers that uh, are coming out of a model or test facility or any other aspect where there's some sort of sensor uh, involved and it's capturing data and it's printing those out, you know, usually to some form of a file. Now, that data that comes out of those, whether it be a CAD simulation or a uh, real-world test or some other thing that generates these, um, that's referred to as the raw data. It's kind of the numbers that come straight out. And a lot of times, you want to perform various aspects of uh, signal processing on that. And here, I don't mean just generically doing something with the numbers. I'm actually specifically talking about um, working to get the time-based data over into the frequency domain <clears throat> because you can learn a lot about physical systems by observing their behavior in the frequency domain and quantifying their behavior in the frequency domain and uh, even running filters and other aspects to manipulate data that is in the frequency domain. And um, so first, what is this frequency domain? What's it all about? Where does it come from? Uh, basically, any time history that has kind of um, you know, a unique Y for each X, so not something that spins around and doubles back on itself, but kind of a function style result of data, uh, can actually be represented in the frequency domain um, by having a series of sine waves and each of these at a particular frequency that are then given some weighting function. And when you add those together, they actually can recreate that time history. Or if you go the other way, you can run something called an FFT, a fast Fourier transform, which will actually take that time data and turn it into uh, frequency domain data. It finds what those A's are and what those omegas are and actually creates a new plot for you. The x-axis is the omegas, the y-axis is the A, for each omega, and it basically builds in what all the different um, A1 sine 1, you know, A2 sine 2 are. So signal processing involves the study of signals, which can come from a variety of sources, 
Signal processing often involves transformation or processing of data in the frequency domain um, and using quite often filters. Um, as mentioned, any time history uh, can be defined by a sum of sine waves and each with a factor of set, you know, the, the multiplier. Uh, that's referred to sometimes as a weighting factor or a modal participation factor, and then the frequency itself. In the case where you have a signal time history, you can use the FFT to extract the A's and the omegas and build them in a new plot, which is a basically an amplitude versus frequency plot. And then encoded in that is this same data of the A sine omega T. And then you can do filtering and things like that. So let's keep going um, and look kind of at an example here. Um, here is uh, numerically just an example where you may have uh, a signal that's just kind of a constant. And then maybe you have uh, the A1 you're given is 3, the A2 is 1, 5. The first frequency that goes with the A1 is 30 uh, hertz. The second frequency is 75 hertz. You have a sampling frequency, 256 points per second. And then maybe there's a phase shift. Um, and then how many actual samples that you're going to take. And so when you take this information and just turn it into a plot, which is straightforward by running the code that's at the top, you basically are looking at uh, what we're trying to do is build up S down at the bottom because we're going to show you how an FFT breaks it back out later. So let's first build it up, and that's literally the S1 plus S2 plus S3 gives you that S at the bottom. And all we did to create you know, S1 was the given ADC, and S2 was that A1 times, and the S3, S3 is A2 times. And so they're just S1, S2, and S3 are just kind of fairly raw signals. Um, and then you add them together, and, and then you get S. And the idea is that through these uh, signal processing commands, you can transfer it into the frequency domain, which this FFT does. You've got to do a little bit of uh, work to normalize the data and get one side of it of the zero line um, instead of both sides. And then you end up with uh, something like this, which is, if you look close, down at the bottom, because the first one is the raw data from the FFT, and then the bottom is after we've done a little bit of that um, uh, massaging or uh, normalizing and ABS and the like. And what you see, if you look close, is at zero, you see there's an amplitude of two. So this is basically saying at zero frequency, which is the DC offset, there's a value of two. At 30, there's three. And at uh, 70, there's this one and a half. If you were to go ahead and look back at the values here, you'll see there's the, uh, well, I said 70, but there's a 75, one and a half. There's the DC value of two. And there's the um, three over at the 30 hertz. And so, what the FFT did, um, so sorry about that. So uh, what it basically says is we, we manually got to the signal S and then showed you that this FFT function, which is one of the main functions inside of the um, uh, signal processing library, allows you to then go back and you get to that bottom plot, which is the frequency content. And that's really what the FFTs do. Now, there are a lot of things you can do once you're in the frequency domain. I don't go into them very deep here because we're just going to kind of sweep through an overview of these groups, signal processing just being one of them. But if you look at these commands, you have a IFFT where you can do inverse and go back from frequency to time domain. You can uh, run through all different types of filters, which will let you pass high content of frequency, mid-band frequency, low-band frequency, uh, and create downstream results and downstream plots that are a function of uh, frequency domain manipulation. And so from there, we leave it to the reference guide and, and reading about it, but it gives you an idea of uh, signal processing. Now. Another category is uh, statistics, and this is basically what we all learned in our uh, late high school or, or early college statistics class. So there are basically functions built in. It's a, a very uh, large library, 
um, over 85 commands that are dedicated to statistics specifically. Um, you got Weibull functions and uniform distributions, normal distributions, um, all different types. And so what we basically do here is just introduce you to the concept of the library. If we want to go ahead and just take a look in the context of the help, we can go over here and do the help. Snaps me over to the library here. And when you go in and you have all these OML categories, here's the statistical one. I click on that. Then you see the entire statistical uh, library. And it is a large group that let you work stats type of functions built in. And so again, from there, we refer you to this reference guide. And because uh, you can only go over so much uh, in a class, because these three or four sections that I'm showing here, you know, they introduce actually a couple hundred out of our 579 functions are all just in these groups here. So we're not going to go deep into all of them. Uh, just be aware. So you got the signal processing set, you got the statistics set. Um, ODE is a small group, but there's a few different choices of being able to take a representation of a differential equation and run it through um, one of these ODE solvers. All this is doing is leveraging the already built-in numerical methods capability in, this, in the code and providing a way um, to pass you know, the differential equation in and to be able to get uh, the integ integrated uh, state information back out, see how it stores it in uh, TY. And again, um, not going real deep into it. This is just a little bit of a catch-all chapter to make you aware. You don't want to go about your business and not even know that there's these groups of uh, uh, solutions. And speaking of the help, uh, it would be good to take a few minutes, not during the class, but sometime, and just look at each of these under the OML reference guide. You can see the groups of commands. This is what makes up the 579 commands. And that way, any that I uh, didn't touch during the class, you can at least be sure that they exist. But I pretty much cover all the groups during the course here, even if, even if briefly like this particular chapter. And then the last one is optimization, where you can basically give a cost function and have the solver uh, find the settings for design variables given the constraints uh, for an optimization. And so there's a few commands built in. Similarly, there's this optimization section in the OML help. And you can go in there and look at that and uh, go through those uh, as well. So again, it's a of all the chapters, this is the one we go through most brief. It's really just an awareness raising, not so much a training of what each of those are, to make you aware that there's signal processing, statistics, differential equations, solvers, and optimizers built into the code. And uh, from there, it's going to the reference guide and reading about the different capabilities when the time is needed. But having said that, we actually did build a little bit of an example for you. So on the manual in page 73 is uh, where the meat starts for uh, exercise six. So there's a DIFFEQ. Uh, exercise. So you can just get a little bit of hands-on. Uh, there's a signal processing. Again, a little bit of hands-on to do something similar that you saw in the exercise. And then uh, we're going to move on to the next chapter. So go ahead and again that's page 75 I believe. Uh, how's that for my memory? 73. Page 73. I'm going to give you, um, this one there's a lot you have to kind of type in by hand. So I'll give you about 11 minutes or so, um, somewhere between 3, well, 3.55 and 4. We'll start up with uh, Chapter 7. So I'll uh, turn it over to you for the next 10 to 15 minutes here. Page 73 in the exercise manual. Okay, very good. Again, uh, if there is part of the exercise that you did not have time to finish, you have all the material. and You can work on that um, later after the class. But we want to keep going so I can at least introduce the remaining concepts uh, by the end of uh, our final day here. So we're going to move on to Chapter 7. 7 
is really more on the programming side than maybe you know pure math operations and that is because compose and the language that it has is just as much a scripted programming language as it is um, uh, an underlying math engine so some of you may have had programming courses or you still are uh, having them now in school and uh, once you learn a programming language the concepts um, in, unless you cross over into object oriented uh, but staying in kind of a traditional procedural flow programs the concepts are pretty similar and it becomes a little bit just different syntax but for some of you maybe you haven't done a programming language at all yet so we're going to briefly introduce the commands here and uh, at least you see how it works in this environment let me double check that you are seeing my screen yep. okay so this one is uh, called Expressions, Logic, and Looping, and it's kind of about flow control uh, within the context of programming. So the first one we introduce is the for loop, and that's a loop that allows you to continuously uh, act through this given loop until a condition that you've described has been met. So here in the example, you see the syntax for i equals 1 to 10, total equals total plus i end and uh, once you once in this case the four has a counter built into it and so each time it's doing a loop it's automatically without you having to tell it it's incrementing i and here we're just running a little math operation to use i just to show that it's changing and then after the tenth uh, loop then it passes on beyond the end statement now if you do these interactively switching over here to the compose domain um, this is kind of the first example that we've seen where you if you're doing it interactively it's not just a one line definition for example so if I do for i equals 1 to 10 and I hit enter it just passes control back to me but it doesn't really do anything it's waiting for the other part because I've introduced something that needs an end to it so for each of the four loops you have to have uh, in end. So here I might say uh, t equals i times 5 end. And then it, the end triggers that the whole package is complete and it goes ahead and uh, sends it off of course up in the um, editor. And let's do our clear all CLC because this is another one of those where if you're not careful you don't do clear all you may end up doing a counter on top of some previous result a number and, and then I can run it uh, accordingly there so when you start getting into these uh, types of syntax that involve more than one line for it to be complete I, I highly recommend that those get done in the editor side and you can always click on run because otherwise it starts to get kind of hairy especially when you get past the trivial academic level and you get into real ones that have they might you might have nested for loops so you might have for i equals 1 to c for j equals 1 to um, 50 and I basically say I times J uh, you know, sometimes there's built-in tabs here so that gets really funky if you try to start to do that without uh, first doing it in the editor so here we'll run this and this is basically a 500 line loop so it's going because it's going to run the inside loop um, well it's going to hit this first I set it to 1 hit the first J, then it's going to operate the inner loop until it hits that end, jumps back out, increments I, goes back in and does it again. So that's what you call a nested for loop if you haven't seen that um, before. But any of the category here where I'm showing uh, when you get into you know if logic, while logic, um, switch logic, for logic, just build up the script and the editor. Uh, and, and in fact, when you're really doing real world, real world work, you're spending most of your time in the editor anyway. And then you're just hitting run when you're ready to exercise a script that you've created. So, so that's a for loop. The integer does not have the sorry the uh, incrementer does not have to be an integer. So here I can say for i is one to uh, ten, but count by point one. So keep that in mind as well. And you also don't have to have hard coded numbers. If I go over here and say uh, t equals 10 you know the programming language of compose is made up of uh, variable substitutions anywhere you know and everywhere right so 
I'm going to make this number small because that's kind of the big, uh, big for loop there. there you go. So you can put in there, you can even put equations. So I'm going to say for 1 equals i to t plus 5. It worked just fine. So even though the example showed a 1 through 10, you know, with hard-coded numbers, you can build this in. You can even call functions if you want. I can go sometimes, you know, maybe I have an array up here of a equals 1, 2, 3, 4. And then I'll go and actually use a function here. Uh, 1 to size of a. I can type. So it loops through. And this outer loop goes through, which is uh, size is going to be uh, 4. Or actually maybe a safer one in this kind of context is length. Same thing. So, um, Keep that in mind, you can fill this however you wish. So, Okay, moving on. There's a while loop. Now, remember, a for loop is something where you tell it what the counter is going to be. It's kind of predestined of when it's going to finish. Um, depending on you know what that end number is, if that itself is a variable that's changing, that could make it a little bit less predictable. But in general, you kind of are defining the conditions right up front. The while loop is kind of um, one where you could potentially even create an infinite loop. It's basically saying, I'm going to stay inside of this loop until a condition or an expression that I set up is met. So here, I'll say sum equals 0. I'll set up this loop while sum is less than 10. Then, um, in our case, do sum is sum plus 1. And then it uh, echoes it out. Now, if I had not done sum equals sum plus 1, this would have just stayed in a loop forever because there was nothing to call to cause sum to change. It's going to stay zero infinitely. So you, you have to make sure you look at the logic that you're putting in place. But just like with the for loop, you know, the numbers and the logic and the different expressions, you might have functions you're calling inside the while loop. You can do anything. I'm showing very, very simple, actually as simple as possible examples here. But realize that these loops, you can have 500 lines of code inside of a while loop. and um, and even have other functions called inside of that. But the key idea is that you're providing an expression that uh, will be held until, the loop will be held until that expression is uh, no longer true. You have a switch case, which is more of a discrete type choice. So instead of uh, maybe more of a continuous one like the previous examples, this is basically saying, look, take a look at a particular value and I'm going to enter these choices depending on what that value is. So switch A, if uh, the case of A being 3, it's going to do the logic inside of that block. And then it's going to jump completely out of it. Um, it's a one-time thing. This is not a loop as much as it is a programmatic flow control where one piece of it is going to hit. But I do want to draw your attention to what happens if the condition is not met with any of the noted case choices. And that is, you use the word otherwise, not else. Else does not apply in this context. You'll get an error. So when you do a switch case, um, you give it all the candidates you can think of. It is good programming practice to always put in otherwise, because just once in a while, your code might do something a little different than you think it's going to do. and you may not realize it because if you don't have this, uh, you might not realize that, you know, let's just say it's crunching numbers in here as opposed to echoing something to the screen. Well, you might think it's hitting one of the branches which exercise numbers when never it really did. So it's always good to have a little otherwise with a information that says, hey, uh, there was no valid choice here. It gives you some feedback. So that's a switch case. It's a discrete kind of single pick type of logic flow. And then the one many of you have seen before, which is the else and uh, if, and else if, um, and all the different expressions that you can make. Keep in mind that if you do compare numerical uh, equals, that it is two equal signs in order to do an expression comparison. Uh, if you do one equal sign, I'd have to I gotta play with it a little bit in Compose, but in some languages like C, it'll be happy for you to type that. But the issue would be that it actually assigns the value, say, of 2 to A instead of doing a comparison of the expressions. And then you may remember um, the, the precedence 
of expressions, you know, parent power, parentheses power, uh, the order of uh, expressions, because when you do comparison, you may have big long expression on one side compared to a big long expression on the other side, and you have parentheses and greater than signs and not equals to and, and the like. There are commands for those same things of less than, greater than, equal than. Uh, I kind of find them not as convenient to use as the symbolic version, but just wanted you to be aware that there are the uh, actual commands if you wanted to um, do certain, you know, make, make your expression of uh, utilize these little baby functions instead of always just the symbols. Um, there's an entire family of is checks. This goes back to the Booleans. Um, if you do an is function check on something, you're going to get a Boolean back. Again, it's, remember, it, the code reflects a Boolean as a 1 or a 0, but it remembers underneath that it's a Boolean. So there's a big list here showing in this slide <clears throat> that you can check to see if things are global or are, uh, are they equal. Uh, is it a directory? Is the, is the entity a Boolean? Is it a cell? Is it a structure? Is it a complex number? Is it a prime number, a real number, a scalar number? Um, is the string given a space? Is it a vector? This is a popular one. Uh, we talked about the row vector and column vector. Um, and so those just return booleans. We can just do a quick demo on one of those guys here. So let's say that I have A equals the 1, 2, 3, 4 case here. And I say is vector A. That comes back 1. But if I had said A is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, which is a 2D, and now I do an is vector of A, I get 0. So that's a neat little uh, Boolean. And basically, you tie these Booleans into your, your logic flow and your expressions. The whole point of all of those ifs that I was showing earlier, if I go back up a little bit, and you get into these ifs, is that you're doing comparisons. You're comparing you know, expressions to each other. And, and the is class of commands can help you uh, check something. And then you know if it's a 0, it's a false. If it's a one, it's a true, and then you can continue your logic flow based off of that. So here's an example. Uh, we did the is vector already. Uh, you know, if your length is less than three, so those are pretty tiny expressions here. Uh, here's a for loop that is a little similar to what I showed as far as having a variable based uh, counter. So it's wide open for that. Here's another case where you do a variable-based um, counter, and you can actually take and use i and create these plots that are all based on you know what what i is. So to give a little bit of hands-on on that, um, on page 83 is exercise where you can get some examples. So today it tends to be a little bit you know more uh, exer uh, lecture exercise lecture exercise, not quite as long lectures, which is just where we want to be because we want to get through up through chapter 10 by the end of today. So go over to page 83, um, and you'll get a little bit of hands-on in this. You're going to build up some for loops. You're going to see some of these uh, expressions, this one over here in section. Step 3, section 2, you know, you get some nested fours with ifs looped inside of them and start to look at some of these a little bit more complex expressions. So go ahead and take the time to do that. And that's, uh, again, about 10 minutes worth, so I'll dial back in at 420, and we'll continue on from there. Okay, hello again. Let us continue on here. Uh, again, plenty of time after if needed to finish the exercise. But we want to get into Chapter 8 which is titled uh, Functions and Debugging. And, and this is a, a, at a pretty major piece of what the product has to offer. Um, again, for those of you who performed programming in the past, then the concept of functions may be familiar, but you still have to learn a little bit about how the syntax works here. And if it's brand new to you, then it might look like we're going through a little bit fast, but um, we'll, uh, we'll do the best we can to make sure that you understand the, the concepts. So. Chapter 8, uh, Functions and Debugging. And, and they go together because the Compose environment, uh, as I mentioned briefly on the first day, is what's called an IDE, or an Integrated Development Environment. And when you want to deal with debugging code, um, in, in real-world code, you a lot of time have uh, times have functions 
in various files and you have functions that are calling other functions and the debugger helps you uh, manage through all of that. So let's start out, what is a function? A uh, function is a relatively small program or you can think of it as a modular piece of your program um, that is in and of itself a uh, script that will take arguments passed in and perform an operation and return um, in some cases, it returns arguments. In other cases, maybe you just have it write to a file and it's not going to return any uh, arguments. Uh, functions can be design designed to take in these uh, arguments. That's where the input is that you see there uh, when called and key can be designed to return information back to its calling context, which could be the root program like we've been coding in so far or actually another function that has called this function. Functions can be stored in files and they can be accessed by scripts outside the file where the function is stored. This goes back to the path that I talked about in day one, where when we go over here to compose, and I type path, and you see there's a certain set of paths. And I mentioned about that startup script file, where sometimes you want to have the code add a whole bunch of other paths. But one of these reasons is if you have files which uh, are for, for your own homegrown functions, the code needs to be able to see that those are there. Um, so in the case of uh, setting up the path, you can, for example, store your files with various functions, you know, in my func path area and set that up. And so that when the code invokes, when compose invokes, you automatically see that and then it'll recognize um, that function. So if I go here into the uh, example, directory here and I'm going to jump over here to a hive demo directory and have all these and this is one of the paths that it's going to see because it's the present working directory and I have this uh, little JSQ uh, example which we'll go over more in a second it's a little baby function um, and this code is uh, um, I gotta actually get this to uh, recognize this let me pull it over so that it is here and loaded and then should recognize this. Oh, oh my bad. Um, do a file save. And see why that isn't showing. See it recognizes it. All right, it's just because I wasn't putting any arguments in. So the error made me think it was not seeing it. The error was that I was not giving it some numbers. So it saw it the whole time actually. So going back to the definition, when you create a function, um, you do it with the syntax of a function name. So you have function and then the name of the function, that's what you're actually gonna um, have it return as um, and equals and then the, uh, well, I guess this would be called the function name. So it's really function return variable equals the function name and then a list of arguments. More generally, if you look at this next slide, you have the word function, the um, variable name of the return, the name of the function, and the input. So an example here might be this function, uh, something called output equals the Simpson integral, or function dx equals func of t of x. And if we go and look at an example that might have this, let me go pull that down. And you just find the one that had the function. I had not opened this in a little while. I think it's right here in the Euler spiral. Yes. So this is a program. And in this case, so there's a couple different ways you can manage the functions. In this case, the definition of the function is inlined with the code that uses it. So in that case, it's easy to be found. It's like going to be the, the, the source of this function is going to be loaded even when I just run this script and then down later in the script that it's calling it. And that's uh, in contrast to where you might put this function in a file, which I'll show you in a second, and we use it like I did with that JSQ function, which has uh, accesses the function definition over in a file. So if you look here, here's that you know function name and there's an end that goes to it. And then you have the name of the output and the name of the actual function. And in this case, it's gonna look for four arguments and then this in here is the guts of what this function is going to do when it's called. It's going to take these arguments that are passed in and it's going to do stuff with them. And then if you choose to send something back, 
you assign it to that output variable name, and that will return that will return um, that value. Like, do you remember sometimes we assign something like you know a equals gsq four five or four four or four five. So it's the concept of this function returning something that you can assign is what will work when you have some function um, output. So if you go down farther and look where this is actually called, that's that's the function definition. That tells what's going to happen when the function calls. Here's where it's actually called. So we're calling a Simpson um, interval, putting in an anonymous function. This has a little twist to it, where it's actually sending in. Um, what's really being done here is it's assigning this F1 being a sine, and this F2 is being cosine. So it's actually like passing in the sine and the cosine in there, and then passing in some variables, and then this performs. Um, function thereof. So, uh, and as you can see, like when this sign comes in, then it knows it's a function, so it's going to do the f of the f of i. So, you can dissect that um, on your own, but the general idea is you can have the function, it's got to follow this syntax, it's got to have an end, output equals function name. Now, in the case like this baby JSQ model, in this one, um, notice the file name is uh, JSQ. So when you have a function that is stored in a separate file, you want to name the function the same as the file name and vice versa. Um, and that helps Compose understand where to look uh, when it comes to searching through the paths and finding this set of, you know, you might have a hundred different functions all each sitting in their own files. And if you have them named properly and consistently, you'll have a uh, this uh, no trouble with the path finding it. So this GSQ is a thing I've been, um, you know, playing with here. So so here's uh, an example of this choose case function, where the contents of the function are this uh, if a little bit of an if logic flow, and then it's going to send back the results depending on how. The logic flow and how the logic flow goes depends on what's being passed as input. And, uh, and in this case, just as a side point, they followed uh, that strategy that if none of the conditions are met, there's a little else that says error. Now, I'm in, I'm in an if flow here, uh, which has an else versus the switch case, which had the otherwise. It's a little trivial thing to remember there, but important. So the return value does not always have to be some scalar value. Like here, this function for the func t of x returns d of x, and that, that in this case was a, a one by three uh, row vector. So you can store data into an array, and then when it comes back, you'll have that full data at your disposal with an array. Um, you want to keep in mind any sort of programming, you want to keep in mind the concept of uh, context and, and what is global and what is local. And so if this concept is new to you, it basically works like this. Um, there, there is the ability in most programming languages to declare a variable which would be seen not only in the main root area, but inside of your functions. But that's, that's bad modeling practice. I should put a big X on this screen here because it's very dangerous to use global. That's, that was, that's 1970s programming style. So you want to uh, pass arguments in, in all cases, and use them in a local context. Or if it's something that makes sense to, you can declare the variable right locally inside of the function. But stay away from doing globals. Um, I don't know if they teach Fortran in college anymore, but we've learned a bit about. Uh, there used to be an emphasis on doing globals. That's long gone. And you want to, because the idea is, if you have a program uh, like a function that you've written. You want to be able to hand that function to a colleague or a friend of yours. And if that has a dependency on a variable which is defined outside the scope, then that function is not going to work properly or worse. It's going to work but work wrong in your friend's script. Whereas if you set it up to be a module that inherits the data that it needs locally or declares it locally, that's needed locally in the local scope, you'll have a healthy function. So keep that in mind um, and try to stay with uh, local variables as much as possible. Stay away from globals. Um, as mentioned, 
functions can be stored uh, in files. And there are, uh, in the context of functions, there's a set of commands that can come in handy. Um, so we'll go through just a few of those. And again, at the end of the chapter, there are some additional ones listed. But one of them is a built-in. And built-in is used for the following. There's nothing stopping you from creating a function whose name is something already used in Compose. And if you do that, um, it's going to use your definition, but perhaps you have a reason that you want to come back and use the built-in function. Well, instead of having to go back and change your program and you know have some built-in and then some too, which is your own, you can leave it the way it is and then just put in built-in and pass the function name that you're telling it. Forget that I made my own. In this call, I want you to use the built-in one, and then I'm going to you know, pass in the arguments to it. So built-in is kind of a handy function in the case. Now, I personally don't like to ever create any functions that are the same name, but there can be times where it makes sense to do so. Um, perhaps there's a logic flow where, in one case, you want to use what's coded in um, the program. In the other case, you want to use your own. But I've never really run into that, I guess, in theory. Um, this is a handy utility. So you guys remember that there's a uh, the concept of a cell entity, right, which is an entity that can store um, many of unlike kinds or even many of like kinds. Like here, there's a cell that is storing a matrix of one by one and a matrix of two by two and a matrix of three by three. Well, you can call a function with the cell fund, pass the cell into it, and the function will run on each member of the cell. Obviously, you have to have proper data types if that function's expecting um, a three by, you know, a square matrix, don't send it a string, you'll get an error out. But it is a handy case. Let's say that you literally have a hundred different data cases that you want to run. You don't have to set up in a weird for loop because it would get kind of strange to try to manage, you know, how, you, how are you passing in the correct data. You can actually pre-store all of that in a cell and then pass it in one time, tell your function and you get a hundred results for those different cases, which is a pretty neat powerful feature in the time where you might need it. Um, error is just a reserved command to, it kind of comes up in a little bit of uh, extra information. Instead of just the string you echoed, it'll it'll come up with, you know, hey, error, um, maybe some colors and the like uh, in your script. And those are good to use again inside of um, anywhere in a, in a function. Uh, warning is also there, similar thing. You can tap into finding how many arguments were passed in with an nargin, and you might want to use that. Maybe you need to do a for loop, and depending on if you passed in two or three or four variables, uh, because you can set up to you can set up functions to have a variable number of inputs, but maybe you need to know in a particular use how many, and so you can use this number of argin and argin. You can do a function. Eval, which is just a short way of instead of typing, you know, power parentheses two comma five, I can say evaluate the function of power with two comma five. It's just a short way or another way to, to be able to do that. There may be cases where you need that. Um, a recent addition in the latest version of Compose is that we have a two-way bridge between Python and Compose, and this is a big deal because it opens the doors of each code seeing each other. Basically, you can trade data through, uh, you can push data from one memory space to another. Um, so inside of Compose, you can have the commands to evaluate a Python script or evaluate a Python file um, or grab data uh, from a Python um, memory space. And similarly in Python, you can have data to grab or run a Compose OML script or a compose OML file or grab compose data. So it's a two-way bridge between Python and compose OML. There is a tutorial in here which goes deeper, 5010. So we'll, we don't embed um, additional exercises so much in the, in the class. But uh, if you do have 2017.2, you can dive into that. Oops. So here's an example where I have on the top left I'm inside of Compose with an OML script, I assign three arrays, and I export it to the Python memory space. And then over in Python, I can see that data that's coming in 
from the memory space. I, I have access to it, so I can run a function on it or the like. A few others you can look up if you'd like. Um, now on to the debugging phase. So everything I showed so far was standard uh, compose. But now suppose that you are um, wanting to run a debug. So everything we've done for all of the two and a half days of training to, you know, with a uh, per two hour segment has been in what we call the authoring mode. But if you want to go into a debug mode, you can click on this. Before I do it, I want to show you something in the menu. If I'm in authoring mode, the only thing I see here is to start debugging, which I can do with F5 or selecting this or clicking. It's all the same thing. Um, so I'll say yes. Oh, wait, no, I don't want to save that. Sorry. So I'm in debug mode. Now, when I do that, actually, this menu changes. And I can have what's called a watch list. I can have a call stack. I'm just going to get each of them in here. And ah, breakpoints. A lot of the uh, in this regard is breakpoint management. Breakpoint management. So I have my watch list, um, my call stack. Now a watch list is something where you pick particular variables that you want to see what values they are, um, and you can let's go back to the watch list here, and let me put a breakpoint which is uh, right here. See if I can run this and get it. Hit the breakpoint. So now I, I what's happened is um. In a debug environment, it runs the script procedurally until it hits a breakpoint. And at the breakpoint, you can do things like uh, add particular variables that you want to look at. Oh, I have to actually step past this. Let me do one more breakpoint and start and hit the next one. And now it should see H. So there's H now because it had to process that line to get that number. So you can go in and, and uh, observe the values. Um, and do that with you know quite a large size of potential uh, values that if you want to run through your script for debug. A call stack is basically we talk about you know uh, there's a root code uh, or a root program and then that's going to be calling functions but you might have functions that call functions and those functions call functions so you can end up having actually quite a deep stack of functions and so the call stack tells you exactly where you're at. So here um, it's you have to kind of read bottom up started out in the main, and then it called it Simpson Interval. So right now, I'm in the context. This breakpoint is in the context of this Simpson Interval function, which is exactly where I'm at. Okay. Um, if you have, and this is what's real handy, if you have multiple files, and they have to be loaded into the composed memory space, but if, it, if your logic flow jumps you from one file to another, then Compose will actually jump over to the other tab, and go through that. And so this is one of the handy things with the breakpoints is you can scatter them throughout several different functions as long as you've loaded that file that has that function into Compose. And it will literally auto tab over to that one as long as it's loaded and snap over to its breakpoint. And so even though you're winding your way through call stacks, it'll keep bringing you to the present one. And that's a real powerful uh, feature with an integrated development environment. Um, so when you do one of these things where you hit the breakpoint, you can you can take one step beyond it. You can step if I'm inside of a function or a loop, I can step out of it. Um, I can keep stepping and up until I hit the next breakpoint. I can step and I can just hit play and keep on going. So there's kind of these different choices. Now this one's being called uh, inside of a loop, so that's why it's. So let me try to step out again. See, it's uh, stepping out of that loop, but um, it's quite a long one, so it's going to keep stepping back in. So let me, I'm going to keep doing out just to skip over that uh, for loop, see how many times, and then how many times that one goes through. Well, here's what I can do then. I'll put a breakpoint here, and I will uh, play, uh, see, go until, and it's going to continue to hit that breakpoint. So I'll delete that breakpoint, delete that breakpoint, hit start, should run through get a bit farther here. Um, actually, it had already gone past that T equals line because the Simpson integral was being called down here, so I should have put my breakpoint down here. But anyway, you see the idea continued to flow on. So a lot of power with the debug environment. And you can play with the different steps. And there's uh, context menus, like I mentioned. There's that, I didn't show it, but there's this breakpoint manager down here that lets you, uh, like maybe you've set a bunch of breakpoints, but you want them to not be active for a certain run, so you can 
deactivate them while still keeping them there. So we've gone through most of this already. And this is something that you can play with. Okay, so we're going to do uh, chapter eight. We're going to create your own function. It is on page 89. And you're going to go through and uh, write your own baby quadratic function here. Get you a little bit of hands on to feel what's going uh, for the function writing. And then you'll do just a small debug step. And that'll be it. So it's about 442. I'll give you till 455, about 13 minutes uh, to run that. And then we will move on from there. Okay. Very good, let's continue on. So we're gonna get into strings and files and uh, file IO, they all relate closely together. So let's dig into that. This chapter is a little bit, uh, a little bit longer. So strings are uh, fundamental and important entities in programming. Strings are a series of uh, characters. Basically we saw that with the matrix holding the array of characters. And they provide a mechanism for a script to communicate with uh, the outside world or a user or files. Strings are often constructed with a set of given characters along with utilizing the values of the variables within um, the program. So we use them as uh, uh, variables to be used downstream in the program. When working with strings, uh, a lot of it is about controlling of formatting. So in Compose, Literal strings are denoted using the single quote. And so if you see, I want to show you something right off the bat here. Uh, let me uh, let me get out of debug mode here and do a little cleanup. Okay, so uh, one of the things I want to show you is, you know, just display or disp with a string in it is the main kind of generic way to just echo something um, back out. Notice that there is not actually a print command by itself. That is not a known function. So keep that in mind because sometimes by default your brain might think, well, it's just a print. Now for formatted printing and file printing, there is the word print, but it's, it's print f on either end. Um, we'll get into that in a little bit. So when you get into format specifiers, there are uh, these which are quite consistent through several different programming languages. So the percent %s is the specifics of formatting a string. Uh, percent %d has to do with formatting of an integer. Percent %f is formatting a floating point integer. And we'll go into what each of these letters mean if they're new to you. Uh, percent %e is for formatting a um, scientific notation based uh, print out and then G is a smart one that is going to actually look at the magnitude of the value and if it's over uh, in, an, in an absolute sense, absolute value sense, it'll look if it's over or under a particular threshold and if it's under the threshold it'll write it out the number in floating point format and if it's over the threshold it'll write it out. I believe that threshold is a million but we can play with that. Um, so let's start out with the uh, percent s. So these formatters, first of all, the context that these format specifiers live in is when you move from um, just the generic disp, which is totally a, a parrot back, into wanting to do some formatted. And when you do that, that's where that print word comes in, and it's printf, basically standard, standard uh, stands for a formatted print. And as soon as you do that, then you can give it this format specifier. Now, the percent is basically a flag to tell it that it's a format specifier. The large number n is the number of columns that are going to be reserved for that string to be written out. Um, the small uh, number, well, so the, the big n designates the total columns. And the string's actually going to be written right justified. So if you have more room than you have string, it's going to shift it over to the right. And then the small n, in the case where you want a subset of the given string to be written, you can tell it to um, do this with a small string. So let's try these examples here. So let's say I do uh, 
going to bring this up a little over a good bit in the command window here. Make it a little bigger. So if I say print F percent uh, 20 hello world, which is much less than 20, um, oh, I might need to give the S to tell that I'm giving a format specifier of a string. And it reserves 20 columns, does a write justification, and then does the, uh, the string. If I gave it a smaller amount, 15 S, you know, you have, you have less. Now, if I give it too small, like 5 S, it's actually going to overload that. If I give it too little, it's going to say, look, I got to have, in this case, what is it, about 11, 12, to print this whole thing out. So uh, in the case where you give too little, it's going to overload it. In the case where you give too big, it just right justifies, and that's all good. Now, the small s is talking about if you want only, say, the first seven characters to be written out. So if I go here and say 20.7s, uh, uh, it's going to take the seven of those letters and write them out in those 20 columns. Um, so the format specifier uh, will allow you to uh, create that for uh, the string. So you can basically um, manipulate the string to however you uh, wish to do so. Um, here, if I did the format specifier with a couple of different arguments, so let's say I go 20s and I do a hello as one and a, and a world as another, then it's going to repeat that format specifier for each one. So there's the 20 for the uh, hello and the 20 for the world. And if I pick off the 7, oops, 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 oops. get up to it's live, take off the 7, and you see that case. The 7 was big enough to hold those. If I go a smaller number, like 20.2, it takes the two first two letters of each one. So it follows that same uh, string format specifier. And then lastly, um, if I do two specifiers, and let me take off the point two just so we have one thing changing at a time here. Um, here it's actually treating uh, this as a string. So it's going to take this format specifier and reapply it across. Now if I were to instead I believe if I go like this, take out these, and I go percent 10s, percent uh, 20s, 10s, see there it's respecting the position. So what it's saying is your format specifier is in the first argument for the strings. And uh, if you want to do multiple ones, you have to embed it all in one. And if I wanted other spaces, oops, other spaces there, if I go here. I could do something like this to control um, additional spaces. There's other ways you can do it too. But. Okay, so that's a brief introduction on string and string formatter. Um, what I'll give you a hint of ahead of time is that everywhere where you're seeing this printf, later on we're going to introduce the ability to read and write from a file, and that's using f printf, and they follow all the same rules. So here it's printf formatted print to the screen. Later, when I open a file and I do file print f, you follow all the same rules, so nothing different. Now, percent %d is the format specifier for an integer. Again, n designates the total columns, write justified, and in this case, there is no decimal things that make sense, so it's just a percent %d. So here, um, and you might notice here that you're going to embed, if you're going to mix this with a string that you're giving, you're going to embed the format specifier right inside that string because it's looking, the percent is actually the thing that kind of triggers it to say, okay, this is a format specifier. And so if I go here, clear that out, print F, um, the, there, uh, there are uh, percent D mice. And then I give it a number, which of course can be a variable, just the same. Now, if I do percent 5D, it does that right justification. And if I give it a number that is, oops, keep doing that and keep clicking into the thing. If um, you give a number that is bigger than what you provide, obviously it's important and it shows the whole number. So it's going to override, just like it did with the string. 
you don't provide enough allocation, it's going to override it. If you provide too much allocation, it's just going to write justify it. That's the idea there. That was pretty straightforward. Uh, if I had multiple numbers, I might say uh, and percent D cats, and then give a number here and a number there. So I'm embedding all the information in here, and then I'm supplying the information. And it is order dependent in that regard. So pretty straightforward for the D format specifier. Um, then you get into floating point specifier, and that's the first number again is the total amount of columns, and then the N is the number uh, of numbers, uh, the value of the numbers that are going to be beyond the decimal point. So like 12, 5 here, it allocated 12 columns. It's uh, the number given was 154.32, but I've asked for five numbers after the decimal point, so it's going to pad those with zeros, and I'm going to end up with a 154.32. Similar, uh, if I have a 24.65, it's going to allocate, in this case, 10 columns, and it's going to print three beyond the decimal point. And then here's B, you know, a number between 10 and 20 is 6.2F, so in this case it has the two numbers. So again, pretty straightforward. Um, let's try that a little bit. Print out. We'll just do hard-coded numbers. You understand that variables can go in there just the same. So um, I have uh, percent 12.23 uh, dogs. I don't know how you can have a piece of a dog, but let's say I give it 7.6. And I just messed that up because I forgot to give it the um, F. All right, so there it is. Twelve. There's twelve columns from well, it's from this space, so it's from there through here. And I've asked for three numbers past the decimal. It's going to give me those three, no matter what. Now, if I went the other way, if I had six, five, four, three, two, one, and I do this, it's still going to give me three, and it's going to follow the rounding rule that we talked about um, the other day. And so here, it's going to uh, only again give the three. So not all too bad. Um, here's for scientific notation, so we can use that same thing, but here I'm going to do E. And there I get scientific notation. So there are 7.654E to the 0. And now here, um, again, the 3 is echoing the 3 after the decimal, because scientific notation is always going to show in the two digits here. Um, and so it notice it didn't matter what format I gave the number in. I could make, I can give the number in, in sign notation. I could just say you know, one, um, <clears throat> because I'm telling it what format that I want it written out at. And it follows all these same rules that if I have multiple ones, I just put it in the string multiple times, and, and now I go from there. And then the last one is the uh, G format, which is the smart one that basically under a million. Uh, last I checked, anyway, under a million, it's going to write out the number in kind of a in an integer if it can, or floating point, and then over a million, it's going to toggle over to that. So let's see if we can get that to work, and then we'll be set with the format specifiers. So um, print f um, hello um, percent twelve point two g, and I'll say under three four five. That one actually snapped up, so let's turn it down. And, oh, interesting. Um, wow. So they uh, changed that a little bit. I might have to do with the fact that I said 0.2G. Let me go back to the 3 to give it plenty of room here. Okay, that's what it was. I was pinching it into forcing it to do this. So if I give it plenty of space, I'll you know, say six of these, and I get to go back to the nine 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 nine. There we go. Uh, and then um, nine hundred nine nine thousand, and then it should be a million where it curls over. There we go. That's more what I was expecting. So you can play with these format specifiers, but when it comes to uh, taking data that you have in your memory space and writing it out to files, the uh, what will become the F printf, it's the exact same logic, is huge because it's the way you get the data in the file uh, however that you want it. Of course, all these different things can be combined. I can combine this in a for loop, you know, write something out over and over and over. 
Now there's a bunch of built-in utility functions for strings. Um, since it's 8 after 5 uh, and I want to turn this over to you at 5.15 because I want to do a two-minute demo right at the end of the final feature, um, I'm going to walk through these fairly quickly. And then the key is, again, to just know that you can go over here and uh, if I take you know, printf and I want to learn about all these string functions, just put up one of them up there. Here's your file I.O. functions right here. And here's where you're going to get a lot of uh, what I just uh, have talked about. A bunch of stuff in there. And then there's also the CAE commands when I go over them in a few minutes. Um, wait, sorry, I'm looking for CAE reader commands. There we go. Which is a bunch of commands to import data from CAE files. So let me go ahead and go through these uh, slides fairly quickly. So you have string uh, CMP, which is a string comparison. And it's simply a, uh, you can almost call it is string identical. Because you're going to get one if it is, otherwise not. Uh, very commonly used one, string concatenation. And it's just the appending of two strings. And this uh, actually gets used a lot when you're writing out to files. Um, string find. This is where you look for a substring inside of a string. And it'll return the uh, index in that string. Remember, a string is just a, a matrix of characters. So it has indexes just like any matrix. So in this case, you can see where you know line starts here at position 11 and is is actually here twice. So it's in position 3 and it's in position 6. So you can go find and locate um, substrings and then of course it's easy to do the matrix referencing to grab the string out of there and use it downstream. You can split a screen by default uh, a screen. You can split a string and by default, it's going to split it at the spaces, but you can overload that and tell it to use a different delimiter to split this. Um, and what it's going to do is take each of the pieces and store them into a cell member. So here you get four strings. And uh, this comes in handy if you do uh, a grab of data from a file. Let's say it. It comes in like you do an F get S, which is a string grab from a file. It's got a string of numbers. It's got 5, space 12, space 9, space 3. You do this spring split, and then you do this other function that's coming up on each of the cell members, which is called a uh, string to num. It actually converts the type, uh, you know, a 1, 2 that's a string over to a 1, 2 as in a 12. And so you can combine those and start to pull and extract numbers out of the file. Uh, string join is the opposite of the string split. Pretty straightforward. Again, you can use spaces or have it create spaces or tell it to do something different. I can trim to just quickly trim off the spaces only on the ends. Doesn't do anything with the ones in the middle. Um, little utility to turn any you know lowercase to uppercase, uppercase to lowercase. Um, this is to. Uh, basically re return what's being written as a uh, string. So if I want to do a uh, string printf, um, I give it a number and a format specifier, and then it's going to, uh, I can store that result in, and it's going to store it as a string. It's got to remember about the type of data member you have. Um, the reg uh, expression returns the result after basically replacing the, um, the expression. So in this case, it's going to take this uh, kind of crazy looking expression here and uh, it's going to effectively take that expression, um, the regular expression, and uh, bring, re return that back. I haven't actually used this one so much. There's the famous string to num. This is used a lot when you pull numbers in from a file. For, if you pull them in as a string entity, you need to turn them into a number. So if you ever have a situation like this, okay, so let's say I have uh, A equals, and no, notice the string declared, okay, see, watch, is string, uh, see, we don't have a string, is num is numeric. Okay, see, that's not numeric. I have to do a string to num, let me store it, B equals string to num of A, and then I actually get it. So here's A and here's B, but watch what happens. If I do A plus 5, it's a crazy thing because it's using ASCII character codes. If I do B plus 5, it works. So don't forget that 
when it comes to numerical processing or even string processing, the data members you're working with have to be of the right type. Okay. All right, about halfway through these. So now you get into the file I.O. where you can write and read from ASCII and binary. And to do this, you have to open a file. And this is an important page 21 here because when you open a file, you have to tell it ahead of time if you're just open it, opening it um, for reading, writing, or if you are writing, you're going to append to what's there or you're going to start back up at the top. And um, these are the different uh, codes. Um, this one's pretty common. Open an existing or new file for reading and writing. Discard contents already in file, meaning if you start to write to it, it's going to start at the top. So that one's pretty common. And that uh, basically, you use when you do, oh, I should mention, we're talking about the fopen command. And that's the key one, to get a file to be opened in, in this mode. you got to give it a file name. And then you give it one of the modes. And it's important here that you store the result of this command because it's going to give you a file ID. That's the ID you're going to use with what's going to be the F printf command that follows all of those same printf format specifiers when you write out to it. Because if you're going to write to a file, you got to tell it which file. You're going to tell it through the ID of the file, which you're going to get from opening the file. And that's where you get into doing um, the F printf approach. Now, very important. This is something that is so easy to forget. You'll set up a program, you'll open a file, you'll write to it, your script will be finished running, and you'll try to open the you'll open the file and it'll be blank. And you're gonna you pull your hair out trying to figure out why is the file blank? I'm looking at code that's writing data, and it comes down to this. You must close the file in your script. It's just the rules of the way operating systems and file and, and slash ends and end of characters and end of files and all those things work. You have to put in the command to close each file that you open, um, at least if you're writing to it. It's good modeling uh, practice. It's good coding to do in any case, even if you're just reading from it to keep it healthy. But if you ever run into a case, you wrote to a file, you open it, it's blank. Your brain should say, uh, I probably forgot to put an F-close statement in my string. Um, go look at a couple examples here of these. So here is a reading of an ASCII file. If I run this, there's a file out here that basically has the same text in it. So here's where uh, I basically point to the file. Um, this one's doing a little bit different. This is actually cutting direct to the content through this. Uh, uh, type statement. Um, let me get one that's going to read a little bit more. Yeah, I have it in different other locations here. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna, because I'm running tight on time, so I don't want to go bouncing around my directory trying to find it. But the uh, the key is that you do put a close whenever you do the, uh, the F open. Let's keep going on that. So here's an example. FID equals F open. And this, by the way, is basically a, a handle for the file. Um, then I can do the printf, you know, except with a file, it's F printf. i got to give it which file ID. Don't forget to do that if you're dealing with a file. And then give it the same rules as before, like there are percent %3D birds, you know, same concept. Notice the F close. So that then I had the, uh, the string written into the file there. Um, slash n is a thing that goes to the file as an invisible character and it ensures that the text is written on a new line. Uh, those are often, sometimes they're put in implicitly. you got to play with it a little bit because uh, depending on how you write the code, there can be an implicit slash n. In other times, you need to explicitly tell it and, and you have to play a little bit with it to know. This is a famous, uh, often used command, f get s. It just grabs the whole string and stores it. So if I do f get s in this file ID, and by the way, it remembers where it stopped last time. So if I do string 1 is f get s f id, it grabs this string and positions it. It's going to hit a little slash n there, and it's going to position the little guy there. So the next one's going to go on line 2, and the next one's on line 3. So it's smart that way. 
and it's going to store that data, and that's where you start to use string splits and string trims and string commands and, and um, manipulate those strings, and string to num is a big one to be used after that, which is an example right here. If I have to get us the second line, it comes in as 14.8, but it's of type string. So I'm going to do a string to num, then it becomes a number, and I can run with it. Similar thing there. Uh, recent build has the uh, API built in to talk to Excel with the XLS read and the XLS write, and you give it some coordinates, and then you can actually manipulate a Microsoft Excel file or extract data directly from it and pull it into the memory space of Compose. So there's a little bit here about the syntax. We're running a little short on time, so I'm going to um, uh, keep going with that, and you can look at the slides. Because there's one last thing I want to get to, which is that we have built in the ability to leverage the many, many readers that Altair has in our software suite. So for RCAE solvers and third-party solvers and some known standard formats, uh, you don't have to write your own parsers. You can literally go, we have a code called Hypergraph that you can take a peek to see if it understands that format visually through these panels. Um, and if it does, then you use these commands, uh, get type name and request name and component name, and it basically zooms in on the data that you want to extract. Let me give you a working example of that. I'm going to go over here to this uh, motion solve OML, because this one's easier to, to show. So it identifies the file, and then I do this get type name, request name, component name, and then the key acting command that actually does the work once I've gotten the signal uh, identifiers is this read vector command. And so notice that this script is only this long. It just does it on a second file. So in like six lines of code, I'm able to go in and extract results out of a CAE file. And, we, and it supports every format that Hypergraph reads in, then Compose will also read in, because it's using one in the same code. So um, these are called CAE readers. They're all fully documented. You can actually read vector by itself, or you can read multi-vectors. You can go and give it a whole range that you want for request components in some cases and, and time range, and it'll grab all that data and pull it in. Um, so we're running uh, out of time here. What I want to do is give you uh, nine minutes to work on the exercise of Chapter 9, and then we're going to come back exactly 5.30, and I want to demo one last piece to make you aware that it's there, and it's in your uh, package, I believe, that you have for training class. So go ahead and take the next nine minutes and uh, do uh, page 99. You won't probably get all of it done, but you'll get started on it. Always finish later, and then I'll come back for one more minute demo. Okay, so let's do something for the final minute here. Uh, in the recent builds of Compose, there is a, a real powerful new feature, and that's the ability to leverage a uh, various set of commands. And there is a chapter in this. We don't have time to go over it, but you have it in your package. Chapter 10, and it allows you to actually use the code to build your own user-defined user interface, and you can then tie the various buttons and fields and checkboxes and everything to whatever action you want, whatever function you want to be called. Uh, so what I did here is I just loaded up an example, and when I run that, it sources the data, and then I just have to run the function. And notice what it does here on the right is it builds the entire UI, and you can see that there's little things here, like I can you know, turn the grid on, I can put in a title, um, turn the grid on and off, I can make selections. Uh, notice how it echoes down in the screen here. If I pick something there, I can pick from previous selections here. I can scale. I actually, I need to create a plot. I can you know, throw a scale. It's wide open what you can do. This is just an example. The idea is you can create your own tool set inside of this environment. Um, all those functions, with the exception of the CAE readers, are consistent 100% with the MATLAB format, so that uh, if you know that form syntax or you have existing scripts, um, it's very straightforward to move into using Compose. So with that, I want to thank you and appreciate everybody who stayed on up until the last minute here, uh, and good luck and let us know um, if you need any assistance with the uh, Compose. And thanks again for your time. We'll uh, talk to you soon.